what's up chat how are you today and uh I, I see some people are coming in i don't usually stream on sundays so thank you for being with us on the weekend i try to just hang with my family and, and not do internet stuff on the weekends uh so it's uh <laughs> but we have special guests today which is so exciting and thank you guys so much for coming on. This is absolutely amazing. It's a very much uh, an honor to uh, speak with Mike Grell, who is one of the best comic writers of all time uh, with us right here. Uh, amazing. And we have his editor, Jeff Messer, uh, right here also, um, <laughs> who is working on this beautiful project on Kickstarter, which we're going to get to in just a moment. I guess I'll just put it up on screen so we can all see this beautiful Kickstarter project. Uh, I came across this. This was posted in an omnibus collectors group uh, on uh, Facebook. And somebody said, Mike Grohl Sable's getting this like deluxe hardcover thing. Have you guys seen this? And I was like, no, I have not. Uh, and I was so excited to find this. Uh, obviously, as you can see, I backed it uh, immediately. <laughs> um, so I've never read Sable before. Uh, and I think this uh -oh, is there's going to be a quiz for people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's going to be a golden age for, for people who are discovering comics from like the 80s and 90s, because all this stuff is getting reprinted in these beautiful collected editions of the now. Uh, and this is uh, something that's that's new. There has been like a paperback collected edition of Sable, I believe, uh, already. Uh, uh, in 2000, almost 20 years ago, IDW did a series uh, in like 2004, 2005, etc. So and. I believe those are getting out of print and difficult to find and expensive also. Uh, yes. And so this is a great way to check things out. And uh, are, so, uh, Jeff, are you the one producing these volumes right here? Um, it's, you know, it's it's a team effort. Uh, okay. This this was my this was sort of my harebrained idea uh, back during 2020 when we were all uh, stuck and bored at home. Uh, at some point, we had started doing Kickstarters with with Mike and some of his projects. And I said, "Hey, we should do uh, we should do a remastered, oversized John Sable project. Uh, we'll launch it in December of 2020, and uh, in 2021, you know, the, the pandemic will be over, and we'll be geniuses because we'll, we'll have all this great stuff to do." And of course, uh, awesome. <laughs> no, we were not geniuses. Uh, the pandemic and and everything dragged on for another year and a half or so with uh, shortages, supply chain issues, what have you. So it took us two years to get the first book printed because of uh, the time that we were doing it in. And we wanted to do it yeah. right. Uh, Glenn Hammond of uh, Comic Mix, and uh, he, he's done a lot of work in the past with Mike and worked on the uh, the IDW trades and some other reprint editions of John Sable. He had all the files. We went through uh, through him, and he's the one that did all of the uh, the color remastering and kind of the tweaking that went on in the first volume and in the second volume and, and, and moving forward. This is a tremendous amount of work to do this. Uh, and it was. Uh, I, I actually, uh, cause I've been talking with Chuck Dixon about doing this with Airboy, uh, his eighties book, because same thing, he had an IDW reprint of it. Those are getting hard to find now. And um, you know, they just kind of uh, took scans and then put it in. It wasn't like beautifully done or anything like these books. And yeah, so it's th like, I feel like page that, by that's page. Because, yeah, th this yeah. is page by page remastered as we call it. So, so yeah. do you, you go in and you have a, a colorist uh, basically kind of touch things up and like, is that, is that kind of how you uh, yeah, the, do things? The, the hardest part was trying to explain to people what we wanted to do. Uh, I hate, and I know a lot of fans hate the fully recolored, modernized color I hate being that. added to uh, yeah, it, <laughs> yes. it's universal everybody hates that that you make it look like modern coloring but it's an older uh you know bronze I got a uh, what did I get here's here's one of the most egregious ones up here the swamp um, thing right you're gonna pull out the swamp you thing, knew it right? you knew it right away. <laughs> oh that's God. the one that everybody is oh, going gosh. crazy that they hate you open this um, up yeah oh I, I can't even open it up because it's too tightly in here ah. Oh well, I'm not going to do it. Worth, but uh, real, yeah, that's worth, it's so bad. Worth the original <laughs> colors. Worth the original colors on that book done by Tatiana Wood. Yes. Yeah, I think yeah. so. If for Swamp Thing. Why? Yeah. Why would you get out crayons and recolor the Mona Lisa? Exactly. Oh, it, 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, uh, the key to the of that, uh, you guys remember yeah. that fresco that got done in Spain and they were touching it up and it, and it, it was a beautiful <laughs> old Renaissance drawing. And then it yeah. became like, just like this, like little scribble. It was all, yeah, this is exactly what they did to Swamp Thing. It's very sad. Yeah. yeah. So our goal was to, to sort of fix, and these original, the first volume were all newsprint. Uh, the first 13 issues were newsprint. So mm -hmm. the original files we were working with, the, the colors, uh, we just we wanted it to look like the original colors, but better, you know, to, to bring out and enhance it and just sharpen it up a bit. There were because of the, the era that we're talking about, there were uh, printing mistakes. There were coloring mistakes. There were things in in these issues that simply just got overlooked or missed or, you know, because of the limitations of printing at the time, uh, just kind of skipped like, oh, you know, nobody will notice that that was miscolored or this was miscolored. Uh, and so we were able to go back and fix a lot of mistakes, uh, not a lot, but I mean, there were some mistakes from the original, uh, the original issues, as well as just just make it pop a little bit more. And, and so uh, we've got some reviews from people uh, from the first volume on the, the top of the Kickstarter. And, um, you know, the, the beautiful thing is that that we were able to preserve the original color intent, but just make it shine a little bit more, make it a little more. I don't want to say modernized, but just give it a little more luster than than those old pixelated newsprint pages had. Nice. Uh, I'm I'm excited for this. So I I in my comic circles where I've been talking reading, I've had a lot of people whispering to me about Sable for uh for for several years, and I just hear this title come up over and over and over again. I'm glad I can check it out uh, with such a beautiful edition. That that's going to make it even better. Um, so. I, I, for, for Mike Grell, if you guys uh, are not familiar with Mike Grell here, uh, I don't know why you wouldn't be. I mean, he is the definitive uh, Green Arrow writer. Uh, he really just transformed that character uh, from something extremely hokey into something that is just awesome. Uh, and so uh, he did that. He was on Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes uh, at the beginning of like, not just you, but like th that Legion of Superheroes, like at that time. And then and then going forward through that, uh, the... Uh, um, the darkness uh, saga there. Like, I mean, that whole uh, every, it was just like one great fire, like firing book after another, like with incredible creatives on it. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a cool thing to have been a part of. Uh, how'd you get hooked up with that, Mike? Luck of the draw. I mean, just sheer stupidity and dumb luck. Uh, the bumblebee who didn't read the book. Right. Uh, I happened to um, be in, uh, Julie Schwartz's office, and uh, I was turning in. Actually, uh, it was um, Joe Orlando's office. I was turning in my second assignment, um, and uh, when I uh, got home, the phone rang, and uh, Joe said, uh, "You think you can handle a monthly book?" I went, "Hell yes." It's like when you ask an actor, can you ride a horse or can you scuba right. dive, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Hell yes. Um, and he said, uh, well, Murray Boltonoff is on vacation and he doesn't know it yet, but Dave Cockrum just walked off the Legion of Superheroes and he's minus an artist. So uh, uh, went in a few days later, talked to Murray. He gave me a, a tryout book, which was seven pages of pencils that Dave had already completed and said, you know, do the finishes on these and then we'll, we'll see. So I finished them up, brought them in and um, he disappeared down to uh, Carmine Infantino's office, came back about 15 minutes later and said, oh, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, well, what's the good news? He said, you got the job. I said, okay, what's the bad news? He said, you can expect to get hate mail. And I said, I haven't done anything yet. It, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. For starters, you're replacing the most popular artist we ever had on the book. And to top things oh, off, we're going to kill off one of the fans' favorite characters in your first issue. And he was like, right. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so like, you got a ton of hate. Grell, you that, huh? suck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was all oh, full no. Grell, you suck. And bring back Dave. We want Dave. So uh, in comic, people are very subtle people who understand the nature is that it's just an assignment and you're just doing what you're No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, goodness the oh internet gosh. didn't exist in the 70s, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah, I mean, it's such a wild time. I mean, so, I mean, and actually like your major runs, of course, uh, like with, with, uh, super Legion of superheroes, green arrow, uh, and iron man, like all of those three had major changes to characters going on, uh, as you're doing them, I guess with green arrow and iron man, it was a little more intentional. I mean, I, were you told well, with iron man's secret identity being revealed and all that, was that, was that done before you were like, or, or was that during your run? Uh, no, it was long after my run. Oh, it was after your run. I thought that was yours. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, 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 yeah. You, yeah. Well, you, you, okay. you revealed it. Uh, you revealed his right. identity. Yeah. You revealed it. Right. Him. Yeah, as as I revealed story. It. Yeah. Yeah. That was you. Yeah, but the yes. yeah, but the but the movie, yeah, that was my vindication. Um the 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 changes that I made to the Iron Man character were a lot like the changes that I made to Green Arrow. There were reasons why I did it in order to do the kind of stories that I wanted to do. Um, and uh, Iron Man in particular, sort of going at this bass backwards, but uh, in, in Iron Man in particular, Tony Stark had grown to be the same shape as the suit, okay? He was like, I'm Tony Stark. See my muscles, yeah. right? Right, very very mid nineties. Very mid nineties, yes. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And and in doing so, the suit became so all powerful. To me, it was like Superman. Um, not not to denigrate Superman by any means, but when you have a character who is all powerful, you have to find a way to create a threat that's going to mean something to him and to the readers. If you can't touch him. Who cares, right? You know, he's going to win at the yeah. end of the day. Um, same thing that happened with the Iron Man. The suit was just too damn powerful. So among other things, I put him on a crash diet. which removed about 100 pounds of muscle. Um, <laughs> took him back and gave him, gave him that, that initial cardiac weakness that he had. That if he didn't have the heart thingy going for him, he could die. Uh, and in addition to it, uh, I made it so that he did have to, again, recharge the suit and his heart every 24 hours or everything goes dead, including possibly him. And I added something else. I made it possible for him to use the heart energy to power the suit as a last ditch effort, which lends uh, uh, a possibility for personal sacrifice, Right. Not not just a danger yeah. to the character, but it's possible for him to sacrifice himself for the greater good, which you hardly ever see anymore. Um, and then what I did was um, to develop the story where he reveals his secret identity. Um, I I had everybody's permission to do this. I didn't just take it on myself and run rampant through the halls yelling, I'm going to reveal his identity. No, it wasn't anything like that. Um, we, we planned this for months, months in advance and set it up to where um, the character of Pepper Potts, who is now married to Happy Hogan, Tony's best chum, um, gets pregnant. And because of something that Stark is in the middle of, he's central to this she's badly injured and loses the baby and he has the feeling that in a different world that should have been his son should have been mm -hmm. his and um so i did this this story where the stark industries is having this big press conference whatever uh, up on the terrace of, of uh, their building and down the street there's a couple of guys robbing a mom and pop and as they're making their getaway there's a little boy who's got a dog on a leash the puppy breaks loose runs out into the street and stark up there sees what's going on doesn't hesitate with the cameras rolling and everything he goes over the edge suit comes on and he smashes the car to smithereens Stops, stops the car, saves the puppy, and all his friends are totally pissed off. Like you bastard, you kept this secret from us all these years, and you revealed it for a dog. 
He said, I didn't do it for the dog. I did it for him. He's a poor little boy. And oh, the, yeah, I, that, I remember reading and, that. And I, I yeah. remember I was upset with the, uh, the pepper pots. You know, I, I feel like uh, I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I don't love the comics trope of, uh, of the, the, the losing the baby thing. They did that with Mary Jane too. Um, around uh, when did they time. do that? And uh, gosh, when was that? It was uh, uh, when it, during the Clone Saga deal, uh, which I think was around the same time. But uh, I remember being very upset by that. But it, it is a it is a good storytelling device that's very emotionally poignant. Uh, and so I, I I understand it now much more than I did back then. Um, well, uh, but first, it's, first it's of all, it is hurting. A, it's hurting a baby, right? <laughs> well. Yeah. Yeah, but but there but there was a reason for all of that, okay? Right. Um but but then the fight started. Uh and it was divided among two factions. Uh we were well and thoroughly into the era of social media then. Um and the squabble was between two factions among the fans. One was in favor of what I had done, the other one was in favor of it should have been something cosmic galactic that would cause him to reveal his identity but that again took away from what my intent was which was to focus on the man inside the iron right iron man but i wanted to go back to focusing on stark's personal life and That's great the, the 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 both sides were very vocal and uh at that point uh, my editor and the publisher got into a screaming match in the hallways. And the next thing I know, I'm out. It was, it, it was wow. just that fast. Yeah, it was just it, that fast and, and that simple. They tried to sweep it under the rug. They tried to ignore it and pretend that it never happened. Just don't even address that issue uh, again. And it wasn't until Robert Downey Jr. stands up at the end of Iron Man goes, I'm Iron Man. Hmm. That was oh my gosh! Vindication so for me. You got that, and uh, I, I I feel like uh, so th <laughs> that's interesting. They were actually like so they were paying it. Were your editors actually paying attention to the message boards and all that back then? Is that and they just saw that reaction? That was it. it seemed to be I, just because I, of I that. think like I think like, they I think they were. It would have been early on, you know, relatively early on uh, in in terms of uh, people uh, using the internet to communicate their opinions as opposed to taking the time to sit down and write a letter. Right. I mean, nobody writes a letter anymore. Yeah, I know. I'm kind of sad about that. I, I'd like uh, yeah. to write letters. Yeah, well, letters. Don't, don't you got chat GPT? <laughs> you got chat GPT will write, that'll write anything for you. you so that's so true. I can, I can yeah. talk to the inter I can talk to the AI. Yeah. <laughs> letter, letters columns are a lost art form. I love them. That yeah. it's fun, and I, I actually really like the uh, collected editions that print the letters columns. Are you doing that with the John Sanders? Which is stuff? which is what we did. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're doing a whole separate uh, supplemental book that reprints the letters columns, house ads, uh, of artwork that we can find that Mike did as sketches that are current to the period that the the issues came out. So every volume of the book we do will have a companion book with it that has all of the letter columns and all the other stuff, you know, that, that we can find from. The Wait, did I get, era. so let's go over the tiers. Cause I want to make sure I got, I'm getting that. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, we'll make, so we'll I got the sure volume one and two, the volume one and two bundle here. Does yeah. that come with that supplemental deal? Yes. The, uh, the Kickstarter uh, funded, you know, once we hit the funding amount, one of the first stretch goals was to pay for the letter column book edition to the campaign. Oh, so cool. uh, everybody, awesome. everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. That, that is part of the campaign. Great. And that's, so we have, that's one of the here. best letter columns ever. A lot of fun. Uh, Mike Gold. There. Yeah. Mike Gold was the editor on that book. And Mike must've been a professional little brother or something because he just loves to get a stick and poke that hornet's nest. And, <laughs> His, his the responses that we got and the responses that the responses that he handed out uh, in the letter column for Sable were just phenomenal. Yeah, Some really hyster yeah, yeah, really hysterical, entertaining stuff. Uh, okay. There are there are people who um, 
one young lady wrote in because I, I did a, a shot of Sable in the shower. And uh, it's full length, you know, or reasonably oh full boy. body. And yeah, but I, but I covered the, but I covered the, the. Hey, um, be careful now. I don't know if, if we're, yeah. if we're, if we're, if we're <laughs> yeah. here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I covered, I covered up certain, certain bits with the, the water spray and she was incensed. You'll have to, you will have to um, subscribe to this oh, I'm omnibus. She wanted and, to and see get, this. And, and <laughs> she was yes, outraged. she did. She did. Yes, see she all, did. All the good bits were, were carefully hidden, and she was not a happy reader. Now, Jeff, if it, what you should have done because this Kickstarter, if, I don't know if you've seen a lot of Kickstarter comic campaints, but yeah. if you do, if you do an uncensored variant. Uh, and you put John Sable in the shower <laughs> uncensored, you're going to make so much more money. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so well, I'll throw this challenge out. So if that young lady, uh, who's no longer a young lady, is still out there and is still upset, uh, she can pledge on a, uh, a tier that includes a full-figure sketch and request that Mike do the uh, the full-figure sketch of that panel Oh, geez. Uh, without the water turned on. <laughs> just, just turn the water off and... Let it all hang out, as they might say. So there you go. So oh, you, you could request that. So, but, nice. but I'll warn you, everybody knows what happens in the shower. I mean, it just has a tendency to go. But, but yeah, there, there's a pruning quality to uh, water. <laughs> yeah. uh, sort of nice. Yeah. So Sable came about after your Green Arrow run, correct? That's that's <clears throat> uh, you you kind of wrap that up and then move to this, or am I no. in the wrong order? No, the Before? other way around. Yeah, the way around. The way around. Okay. I had so after I had done, Legion of Superheroes. I had, I had okay. I had yeah. Warlord. First I did right. Legion of Superheroes, then the Warlord, then Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Mm. Okay, that was the um, Denny O'Neill's reboot, uh, beginning in 1975, and then that was, um, so that was after Denny O'Neill, obviously. Then uh, right. right? Right. Yeah. Well, th right. This was this was after but, the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill. Uh, right. That, after the Neil Neil and Denny run. Okay. Yeah. Which uh, lasted thirteen issues, uh, starting in I think sixty nine and ending in seventy. I might okay. be wrong, but but I think it was right. sixty nine. And, and, and then the book took several years off, and when they brought it back, Denny brought Mike in to do the art with right. around issue number ninety three or ninety four, and and went past a hundred uh, issue the hundred issue. Of Green Arrow, Green Lantern, so or Green Lantern, right. cool. yeah. yeah. So then, um, I had uh, I had done uh, Star Slayer uh, was was a title that I came up with, intending it to be a companion book to the Warlord, where the Warlord is a modern day man in a prehistoric society, practically, um, and the Star Slayer is a first century Celtic barbarian who gets trans into the far distant future at the moment of his death he's in battling against the Romans and as he throws himself onto the Roman spear points rather than be taken prisoner and become a slave um, he's zapped into the far distant future where he's set this task to help lead a ragtag band of rebels essentially trying to save the world from ultimate destruction uh, I, I did that with a company called Pacific Comics. Um, they okay. went out of business very, very quickly. Um, and um, Mike Gold, who had been um, um, public relations guy at DC Comics and a good friend uh, for uh, several years before that, um, called me up one day and said, look, um, I'm editing over at at um, DC now. Uh, actually, no, this was, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, he called me up and said, we're, we're starting a company in Chicago called First Comics, as in First Comics, then Drugs, then the Babysitter winds up in the freezer. Uh, <laughs> and um, we'd like you to come over here and, and uh, do something for us. I said, Something what? And he said, carte blanche, anything you want. And that's when I came up with Sable. Uh, cool. I, I was tired was tired of doing muscle-bound guys in skin-tight suits. I wanted to do something that was 
centered more in the real world and I wanted to do the kind of action stories that I enjoy reading and um, I, I incorporated tons of things that, that I, I really love personally. Um, I've been uh, uh, an avid Africa buff since I was a kid. When I saw my, I'm pretty sure the first movie I ever saw was Tarzan, the Ape Man, with Johnny Weissmuller. Pretty sure. Um, and so, are you that, you're a big yeah. Edgar Rice Burroughs fan then? Oh yeah, yeah. So I so that so that started me off, um, uh, and I thought if I can give him an Af African background of some sort, that'll be great. Uh, but I want it to be very specific that he was not like regular superheroes uh, nothing like superheroes so the the shorthand premise for it is sable is the reverse of batman there's no secret identity um yes he paints his face with um camouflage makeup but you can smear whatever you want over your face and you're not going to fool anybody you walk down the street and you go fred you really look stupid with that stuff all over your face right if you put um, glasses on nobody will recognize you though uh, so, yeah yeah, apparently. yeah. yeah. <laughs> right 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 <laughs> apparently yeah so so uh there's no super no superpowers no secret identity um his only big, deep, dark secret. I mean, everybody knows he's Mr. Blood and Guts, okay? Um, his only deep, dark secret is that he's a closet nice guy. Uh, he writes a series of children's books about a troop of leprechauns living in a fairy mound in Central Park. And they're based on bedtime stories that he told his own children. And... Uh, the only time he ever wears a disguise or goes by a different name is his pen name, B.B. Flim, F-L-E-M-M. -M. When it's written out, it doesn't look bad at all. But when you say it, it's pretty neat. Like, oh, Flim? Yep. That's exactly what I had in mind. Um, and, and when he has to do a personal appearance, uh, he'll put on a um, Harpo Marx wig, a pair of nerd glasses, a fake mustache, a tweed jacket. And goes on as, as BB Flim. His problem is he can never remember what the BB stands for. It's either Billy Bob or Booger Brains or you know Byron Buford or something like that. Whatever strikes him in the in the moment. Um, and so, of course, when uh, ABC picked it up in 1987 for a very mercifully short-lived series, they reversed my reverse. And made it exactly like Batman. By day, the mild-mannered oh, children's author. <laughs> By night, the dark Avenger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was terrible. It was canceled. I think one of the second episodes was on the air. But the, the only good thing that came out of that was um, Rene Russo made her acting debut as oh, Eden nice. Kendall. Yeah. As uh, Sable's literary agent, Eden Kendall. And uh, she was just fantastic you if, if you do watch the series you can't take your eyes off her i mean she is just that compelling even uh, even though that was her debut um she just just stole every scene she was in really really a great lady um and you know for what it's worth department uh if we're if we were casting that sable movie today i would cast her as eden kendall today because she's she's still got it. She's still got Aww. it. Um, well, so then, this, then I mean, F this looks absolutely beautiful. Um, so just as a basic premise plot, because we, we got people in here who might back this. Um, so Sable. So you you said you kind of stripped away that like re and made a reverse Batman kind of thing. It, so he's right. a mercenary uh, sort of super spy type of person. Uh, mercenary, bounty hunter, bodyguard, anything for a buck for hire. His his background is that he was a game warden in Africa. Actually, originally, he was uh, an, uh, a U.S. Olympic pentathlete. 
okay. which is uh, modern pentathlon is running and riding, pistol shooting, fencing, and horseback riding. It was uh, actually created during the Napoleonic era for couriers who had to be able to deliver uh, a message across great distances. If you had to, you know, you start off on horseback. If your horse gets shot out from under you, you have to run. If you come to a river, you have to swim it. Uh, if you had an encounter enemy, you shoot first and then you whip out your sword and defend yourself the best you can. Um, uh, so uh, after the after the Olympic Games, uh, it was originally, bear in mind that Sable debuted in 83. Um, the backstory of this was that um, he was at the uh, Olympic Games in Munich when the, the terrorist attack happened. And following that, uh, he met and fell in love with a girl from Rhodesia and followed her home and started a family and became a, a game warden. And then he made, managed to make himself such a pain in the ass that uh, the poachers wiped out his family at a reprisal rate. He was absent at the time and always wished that he had been there because it would have been easier on him if he had died with him than to carry on. But as a result, he goes off his nut, tracks down the guys responsible and slaughters them in the most horrific ways you can imagine. And following that, you know, if all you have left to live for is vengeance, what do you do when your vengeance is done? In Sable's case, he became a drunk, um, thrown in jail repeatedly. Um, then he falls in with a band of mercenaries who were uh, on a mission going up country into the bush where the bush wars are still raging at the time. And uh, when that mission is over, uh, he's arrested because he's been declared persona non grata. And they pitch him out of the country. They send him back to New York where he's got nothing else to do. He's working on his memoir, not getting any luck with it. And uh, uh, he's, he's keeping body and soul together as a mercenary, hiring out something dangerous. And the, at, the, at the core of the character, He's a guy with a death wish. He really regrets that he wasn't home to die with his family. Now he's he's there. He's a guy with a death wish, but not to the extent that he's going to put a bolt in his own head. He wants somebody else to do it. He's going to throw himself as, into danger all the time. Okay. Right, which, right, which right. Which makes for good stories. And, it, <laughs> and, it, and it's, yeah. It's, it, yeah, somebody who's got nothing left to live for is pretty damn dangerous, you know? Um, especially right. if he's looking for that kind of trouble. Uh, so as the story winds on, um, he establishes a relationship with the young lady who is illustrating his books. And he's attracted to her, but it's really tough on him because the closer he gets to her, the more distant he starts to feel from his own family from his original family and that guilt weighs on him and it it's a it's a continuing arc through the entire run of the book uh, all the issues uh, of how he comes to terms with his with his newfound feelings and how he gradually learns to let go of the past and try to find something else to live for nice yeah. And is, well, uh, not like is, real life. Yeah, which which is the overarching uh, right. the overarching story of the entire series, really is that uh, you know it's a lot of action, a lot of really co kind of cool stuff going on. But ultimately, uh, the attractive part of John Sable is it's it's a guy with uh, with no reason to live, finding reasons to live over the course of this this human journey that has a lot of action thrown into it, which right, is what, right. what compelled me when I was, you know, in my teens and I was reading this book. And then I think that's why it's still around. That's why it's still, 
in the, uh, the the consciousness of the fans is because there's there's a certain amount of humanity to it that you don't get in other comics really well i find that that's been the case with everything i've read of girls work i mean it's just there there's a very human element uh i i you you focus on the relationships between characters uh and that's yes. that that thing is the difference to me between like uh, a good and great comic when you, when you have great it th those relationships and those human moments are really like what what draw out of the comics so yeah. I appreciate uh, that uh, unlike that. superhero yeah. stories um right th there's a great thing when when sable gets injured uh as as he does in the course of his work you know my, mike actually let the guy you know have a cane for several issues of the comic while he's he's healing it's like there's this you know and i'm sure that right. the, the superhero people were like what next issue he's got to be back to normal he's got to be like ready to no it's like the the wounds take time to heal and mike actually right. allowed that to play out in the comics which nobody else had done up to that point and and the scars don't go away you know, nice. the, he's he he gets new scars as he goes along, and you can read the the history of the character in the scars. Really, um, it's it's what makes us interesting, right? I mean, yeah, something somebody who's just pristine and gorgeous to look at. Well, they're nice to look at, but what have you done in your life? What's happened to you in your life? Tell me something interesting about yourself, not just that you're pretty to look at and you're a good guy okay like, who, who really gives a damn about sir lancelot okay <laughs> nice let's go over the tiers uh just so we can talk about like where people should back depending on like you know maybe they just want to check it out or maybe they're really excited about sable uh so the graphic album number one is that uh it, it looks like it's issues number one and two for people who, who just want to check this out and see if they See if they like uh, the the Sable story. Is that is that uh, what that's um, intended to be? One of the things that we want to do with this remastered art is to uh, to reissue some of those in what we're calling kind of European editions, which are about two issues worth of comics in a slightly oversized format. And uh, that's what that is. That's the beginning cool. of that. Uh, so we will, for people who who ultimately miss number volume one, volume two, whatever, because uh, we're going to limit the print runs on these, these hardcover okay. books. So five years from now, if someone's looking for it, we want them to be able to enjoy the remastered stuff as well. So the, the, the graphic album is kind of uh, aimed also to help us um, do European translations in Spanish, Italian, French, German, what have you, so we can release the books overseas as well. Awesome. Cool. And you've got the digital version for 35 bucks. That's uh, so how many, how many issues is contained in a, in a volume? Are we doing uh, the uh, the first volume um, had 13 issues. The second volume has 14. Um, some okay. some of the issues were shorter because there were backup features in some of these uh, issues that are coming out in this volume. It's always going to be around 400 pages uh, per volume. Cool. Yeah, yeah, those are, those are big boy books. So uh, quite a bit here for 35, and you can get of course digital volume one and two for an even uh, bigger discount here, 50. That's great. So you can catch up on where we're at right now and so that's that puts you at issue what is it 27 uh right yes. now through yep. through these two volumes you get to the and end then, of uh, yes and you're looking to do maybe is it going to be two more or one more after this uh there'll be five, five total five total five volumes total. okay yeah. great right. so you got the you got those here now the hard covers are on the pricey side guys but it's because they're not standard comic size i'm going to show you guys what we're talking about right here yeah. uh i can't actually can't get this swamp thing out of here so let me get my green lantern green arrow so i can actually oh there we go the yeah okay all right so this is what they're kind of gonna are, are these gonna be in slip cases or, or not there will be at the end we'll do a for volume five there will be a slip case that will uh oh cool be offered that you can put everything in at the end like a, that's a full great. a full slip case for all five volumes so for now it's going to look a lot like this so this is the uh uh neil adams daniel neil green lantern green arrow and you can see this is a standard comic size right here this is my my buddy pumps pumps back's book it's it's a uh, hugely oversized so you can just like look at the art very nicely now compared to an omnibus an omnibus don't hurt is. yourself don't hurt yourself <laughs> I'm impressed. I would not want to arm wrestle you if you can hold that omnibus in one hand. In an omnibus. 
So you can see that these absolute edition size are amazing. It's like the best way to read comics for real. And yep. this is, it, it, by the way, big, reading it's not this too big. is the biggest pain. I, I mean, it's, it's great yeah. comics, but it is the biggest pain in the butt because you cannot hold this book up. It's impossible. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, no. Whoever had that idea, I don't know. And, and there are a lot of people that complain about those books. Um, that's why we wanted to keep it around 400 pages per. Once you, you know, once you feel yes. it and see it, it's like this is a manageable size. It gives it a deluxe treatment. Uh, if it had, if it had gone up to 500 pages, it would start to feel a little too big. I think. I agree, and I I, I like about that size also. That's about the max where it's comfortable to hold, so it's good. Right. So. Uh, the volume one hardcover is also available on here if you just wanted to go into volume one. I uh, I did not find the original Kickstarter. Like I said, I just found this last week. Uh, and I uh, so, so I went in on both hardcovers, guys, uh, because I'm excited about this. But it looks like you're limited Whoa, to volume thank one. You. Um, yeah, well, of course. I mean, I, I'm excited. People have told me about this comic for so many years. I hear it over and over again. I'm, I'm very excited to read this. Um, so uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're here it is. Uh, so how many it. volume ones are yeah. left? Yeah. Um, about 250 copies out of the okay. uh, a thousand copy print run are left. And, and we may, we may leave it at a thousand. I, I don't know. We've Mike and I've talked back and forth about this for a, a long time as to where we want to cap that, uh, that number to make these feel more special, special to the fans mm -hmm. who back them. So, uh, out of, uh, out of a thousand that we printed, we've we've moved about seven hundred and and fifty of them. So real okay. happy with that. So it's very low. So by the time like the next one comes out, there's not going to be a lot of volume ones left. It sounds like chances are, yeah. <laughs> Over time, they're going to yeah, be fewer right, and yeah. fewer. Yeah, right. Cool. I've I've always been of the opinion that if something exists in a edition of a hundred thousand, that's not a collectible. I mean, it's not. <laughs> it, 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 just, it just isn't. It just means that you haven't gotten around to buying it yet, you know, <laughs> or you didn't want it bad enough to buy it in the first place. Yeah. But if you have something that that is uh, limited and honestly limited, like if you want this, you better jump in now or you're not going to get another chance, um, then it actually has value. 10 years from Nine. now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, when there's only a thousand of these floating around in the world, people are going to go, I got to have the old ones. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're going to be crazy on eBay. And I know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find things like that. Oh my gosh. Um, so cool. You guys can get, so Mike, you do sketches too, which is awesome. Uh, so yes. I know a lot of, we have a lot of art fans in the, uh, chat here who like to get uh, limited sketches and things like that. And there's various uh, levels of different sketches uh, he'll do for you. A wonderful artist. Uh, I, I want to look yeah, at a, it. Uh, there you go. That one right there. Yeah. This one right That here. one, that, that's up right there. Beautiful. Uh, that's one of my all-time favorites. That's and that's a, that's a relatively new offering. We we just made that part of the campaign uh, about a week into it. Uh, Mike, Mike has been doing this so long that uh, if he gets bored at a convention, he'll invent something new to do. So he started doing these like this at, con at a convention about two months ago, and everybody loves them. And they, they look stunning, these these charcoal paper with uh, ink and, and chalk white um, highlights are just That's gorgeous. stunning. Yeah. So uh, th this leads me to a question. So I, I, I do a lot of comics myself, and, and so do a lot of people in the chat. Um, and I always talk with artists and I always say like, you know, th this woman doesn't look quite feminine enough or, or pretty enough when it, when it, and that, that seems to be a common, uh, I say failure in artists is, is there like something about drawing the features of a woman to look like, this is like just stunningly beautiful. Uh, is, is there like a trick to making that happen that you can verbalize? <laughs> <laughs> I, it, for anyone who's ever met my wife, you'll know that I'm really attracted to beautiful women. Aww, I just, that is I just am. That's sweet. I just am. Um, <laughs> the, the, there, there is, I can't tell you a trick. Uh, I'm not one of these guys who has a formula for how to draw a face, how to, how to create something that's pretty. I just draw what I'm feeling at the moment. And in this case, um, 
it was I was focusing on the eyes first, but then the expression and mm -hmm. minimizing everything else, you know, the way the the hair frames the face, but the whole head is not delineated. And that little wisp of hair coming down her, her face out of place, a little imperfection, uh, makes a really beautiful woman seem a little more accessible. That it softens her, is what it does. That's, I like yeah. that. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it, it's, cool. it's, it's amazing uh, because it's, it's the, the eyes are just piercing the, the viewer. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's that thing. It's like, oh, my God, she's looking right through me. Uh, I will anecdotally say uh, several years ago, I did a, a live interview, uh, video interview with Mike. Uh, and there was a lady who came up and asked a question. And just one of the things she said was, she says, thank you, uh, because you draw... Uh, the the best cheesecake and beefcake of anyone out there, uh, and she was referring to you know the warlord and his loincloth and all of that stuff. And it's like you know Mike has always been known for drawing uh, sexy sexy people. So you know this, I like this is that. I, I, yeah. You know, I mean it's it's nice it's nice. Uh, you know, I mean comics is a visual me medium, and it's nice to look at pretty things. You know, uh, while you're reading a good story. So I I, did, I have not gone all the way down to the uh, what's the uh, ultimate suit sorry, right I, I was I'm just gonna, i was just gonna say <laughs> that al cap who did lou abner uh was mm. being accosted by someone uh for drawing women with big boobs why do you always draw women with big boobs and he said big boobs are more fun to draw than small boobs <laughs> i could see that nice so oh yeah I, it, it's amazing I also, how people get in trouble for drawing things they like these days. Uh, but that's I, I also I also got a, uh, uh, a criticism from Murray Boltonoff, who was editor on the Legion of Superheroes, who said, you draw your women too tall. I said, women are tall. He said, no, they're not. I said, yes, they are. He said, how tall are you? I said, five foot six. And he said, trust me, women are short and so are you. Make them a full head shorter <laughs> than all the than all the men. And I couldn't bring myself to do it. I bet made them maybe half a head shorter, but not a full head shorter. The artist perspective, they're all tall women to him. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so we here's here here's with the ultimate fan. You get uh, uh all the stretch goals, sketchbooks, trading cards, postcards. Uh wow, you'll be get drawn into the background of a story. And this is this is what I found uh, when I saw, was reading this campaign, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of looking around. So, Mike, you've been kind of out of comics for a while, it seems like. Um, and it only seems drawing like it. new. It only seems like it. Yeah. It, have we just missed stuff that, like, what? Yeah. Uh, oh boy, we'll have to have talk. Well, about de that. Defi yeah. de define comics. Yeah, the, the monthly monthly sure. comics. Yeah, it's been a while since Mike's been doing the monthlies for right. sure. Sure. But but what, what's listed on here is there's going to be new John Sable content that you're doing, so you're making actual new stories with this also. Yes, uh, yes. that's cool. So so what's uh, are you going to keep it still set kind of in the '80s? Or are you going to uh, no bring, Sable, bring things up Sable to date, has or? Sable has always stepped up. Uh, I I did um, two six issue miniseries. One was called Blood Trail which was a way to reintroduce the character to modern audiences and to update him to the, uh, to the current times. Then the second one was called Ashes of Eden, which is um, uh, a heist wrapped around a nuclear terror plot and yeah. puts, them, puts them very firmly in contemporary times. You can't take a character... Uh, expect him to have longevity and freeze him in time. You've got to grow. You've got to give him a chance to develop as he goes along. I had to give up on my initial <laughs> idea, which, which I managed to hold pretty well with uh, uh, Green Arrow and Sable for quite a while, which was every year I made them a year older. And, okay. <laughs> the, and, and the reason reason was I had a, an argument with Julie Schwartz uh, when I was doing Green Arrow way back when. Uh, Elliot Magan was writing the book, and he had um, 
a line that he had written where he, uh, Ollie is complaining about something in his life. And he says, I'm not even 30 yet. And I went, that doesn't play. And Julie goes, oh, no, no, no. None of our characters are over 30 because our audience can't relate to anybody over 30. I said, okay, so how old is Bruce Wayne? He said, 29. And how long has <laughs> how long has Dick Grayson been his ward? Would you say five years? And he goes, yeah, that's about right. I said, so you're going to tell me, tell me. that? I, and, 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 oh, and, and by the way, Robin was supposed to be 15 or 16 years old, right? So right. you're going to you're going to tell me that any judge is going to grant custody of a 10 or a 12 year old to a 24 year old billionaire? And this and this is before Michael Jackson. <laughs> give it a second, yeah, give it a second for that to sink in, right? Right. Yeah. And, and he goes, okay, so they they settle for eliminating that line, right? Um, yes. And that was one of the reasons why when I created the Warlord, I started the story when he's. 43 years old. He's uh, uh, a jet pilot. Isn't, uh, isn't, 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 uh, isn't Ollie f say he's 43 in Longbow Hunters also? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Okay. You know what? <laughs> Why? Why is that? <laughs> at, at that point, I, with Sable and, and, uh, and Ollie both, um, I made them one year older than I was at the time. Oh, that's hilarious. I like right. it. Right? Nice. Um, so my 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 thing with with Sable, uh, excuse me, with the Warlord was that starting him um, at age forty three in nineteen sixty nine because that's when the story flashes back, right? Then he comes back up to the surface of the world and finds out that seven years have passed and he's fifty years old and. When he discovers that, he's like, 50? I, I don't feel 50. Do I look 50? Right? And the, the point is, if you don't act it, you're not that age. I mean, that's all there is to it. Age is just a number, and it only applies to you if you let it. Uh, I, I used to brag that I never fell off a horse in my life. And then when I turned 45, I bought a horse. Three years later, <laughs> I three years later I was performing with a group called the Seattle Knights, and I was falling off on purpose four or five times a day. I was jousting, doing sword fighting, horseback archery, the whole nine yards, and I just absolutely was not acting my age. And anybody who knows me will tell you I'm still not acting my age. <laughs> I don't a to. lot like a lot of injury injury uh, uh, prone activity <laughs> doing that. I, I've, I've actually wow. never I've never ever been hurt falling off a horse on purpose because I was wow. trained how to do it. Uh, it's, okay. a, it's a yeah, it's a pretty extensive course, but it's basically learning to be a stunt man. Uh, I don't yeah. look at right now, but I was uh, once upon a time I was a. 143 pounds and could do chin-ups with a guy sitting on my feet that weighed as much as me. Wow. Look at oh, that. Yeah. Mike Grell oh, is yeah. a legend. <laughs> they, don't, they don't call him Iron well, Man or nothing. <laughs> there you go. But so, cool. so the, 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 the age thing just was another way for me to humanize my characters. Everybody gets a little older you get a little slower as you go along, except the warlord. Um, uh, with 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 Ollie, he changed physically as time went on, and the age uh, did take its toll on him. But not so much um, not so much as the time the time as the miles. Uh, you know, he's got some serious street miles on him, yeah. and uh, but but there was a, a also a point to all of that, which was, I don't want my characters to be the same now as they were then. Um, one of the key points in storytelling, good storytelling, is change. 
know, yes. With, a, with any story, plot setting, characterization, motivation, conflict, change, the big, the big C is change and resolution. You know, the, you, you create the characters and put them in this world and, and create the conflict. But then part of the conflict has to be, how do they solve the problem? You know, what's the big issue here? So you put them in a situation where they continue doing what they've been doing all along and it doesn't work. So they've got to try something else. And that doesn't work. Not only does it not work, but it makes things worse. And yeah. then you put them in a situation where everything is so completely, totally screwed up that the only way they can solve that conflict is to change their whole way of thinking, change their being, change something about them, change and grow. And that's when you give them the resolution. And, and resolution should be something that they could, if they look back, they'll be able to, to track how it developed, but they should not have seen it coming, right? Give, give, them, an ending, give them an ending that's satisfying, but it takes them by surprise. That's a, this is brilliant writing advice. Uh, anybody who, who is a, a writer in the chat here, we got a super chat from Geek Avenger. Thank you for the five dollars. Is Grell still in Seattle? Let him know I'm in his neighborhood. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I left Seattle uh, almost ten years ago. Um, okay, but I but I was in Seattle when I created uh, the, the Longbow Hunters, Green Arrow Longbow Hunters, which was one of the reasons why. I chose the setting. Number one, I'm a small town guy from a dinky little town in northern Wisconsin, a hundred miles north of Green Bay. And in my life at that point, I had only lived in or around three cities. Chicago, where I went to art school, New York, where I broke into the comic business. And I already used that for Sable. And um Seattle, where I was living at the time. And uh, so that that brought about the change where that costume was not going to work. You know, the 1970s Robin Hood and the green leotards and, and bare arms. You may have noticed it, it has a tendency to rain a bit in Seattle. And so sleeves went on, the hood went on. I mean, that was, that was really it. <clears throat> a little Robin Hood hat is not going to keep you dry in the wintertime, not in Seattle. Um, proper trousers. Uh, the reason that I kept everything in the light green, dark green pattern was because I felt that the audience really needed that continuity. So they open the book and go, oh, Green Arrow's got a new costume. Not you open the book and he's wearing purple, Right. <laughs> it's yeah it, it just yeah they, they would spend the first issue if they ever came back to the second issue wondering who the hell is this guy running around shooting arrows in the city can't get, how did you so, um did, did you uh like uh, have any trouble with editorial and all that like making changes and having a character develop an age i mean it seems like uh, marvel and dc just really don't like their characters developing <laughs> I, I had a couple of uh, really special arrows in my quiver. I had Mike Gold, who was my editor, who once again gave me carte blanche with Green Arrow, and Dick Giordano. Um, when, when Dan Jurgens was uh, penciling Green Arrow, Dick was the anchor, and we tackled issues that were um that, well yeah pretty much cutting edge for comics uh we dealt with everything from drugs to hiv to um problems of gay bashing um uh, trafficking the sex trade and and we just hit them over the head with it uh a lot of my stories came out of the headlines and I've, I've been accused of being a misogynist, which is the furthest thing from the truth. If once again, I'm going to point to my wife. 
I'm really, really attracted to strong, independent women. <laughs> and and it's so sad seeing people do that online these days. They like to label people all sorts of things. And it's like you don't know somebody. Somebody wrote a story. You like it or you don't. But like like, you know, doing that to somebody is uh, is very it's such a personal attack that's so nasty and uncalled for. It really is. Right. So. Right. It is. It is. The, just just because just because I've done a lot of stories with a dra backdrop of war doesn't mean I'm pro war. Right. The war just happens to be a very dramatic setting for a human story. And that's that's what I'm in pursuit of. Uh, in, in the case of um, Green Arrow, Denny had set up the character to where he was pretty ultra liberal. And um, he had <coughs> excuse me, made one bad shot where he accidentally kills a guy. And he goes... Hmm withdraws from society, joins a monastery, shaves his head, burns his bow, swears that he will never, ever take another human life. Well, following Sable, which was fairly hard into real world stuff, um, that's not the kind of character or the kind of story that I wanted to tell. And I knew that my readers were not looking for that kind of stuff. So, First of all, I had to change something fundamentally about the character. We got that big change thing going, right? Um, the and, and how I did that was that uh, I set up a situation where Dinah Lance, the Black Canary, has been captured by bad guys. And she's strung out from a forklift in a warehouse when Ollie finds her. And she's been beat. She's there. She's helpless. And the bad guy has her by the hair and a knife in the other hand. And what does Ollie do? He's already demonstrated that he can shoot a knife out of a guy's hand with no problem at all. But what did he do? He shot him square through the heart. Because why? The son of a bitch had it coming. But that also, <laughs> but that also created... The scenario for me to springboard that into the changes in the character. From that moment, I, I compared it in a later story to stepping off the edge of a cliff. Once you jump, you can't unjump. And that moment of decision, that choice that you made, affects you for the rest of your life. And that's what it did. His relationship with Dinah that had been intense, long-term, loving, intimate. The, Ollie and Dinah had probably the best sex life in comics for mainstream comics. I mean, there was no question in anybody's mind. They were shacking up and they were at it every chance they got. And all of a sudden, she can't stand to be touched. And he has his own issues of guilt over what he's done. And that conflict that that personal emotional conflict in, in the relationship was what drove that storyline forward because my entire arc of green arrow is a love story between ollie and dinah it is no matter yeah. where you go in it that that's the continuing thread it's it's the it's the glue that holds everything together I love it. Yeah, the great job with these characters. I'm so excited uh, to to read Sable, uh, somewhere where you're not even constrained by another corporate property because it's it's yours. You can do whatever you want with the characters. Uh, yes, that's that's, uh, that's very very exciting to me because I I think you can go even you know I haven't read this but I'm assuming you can go even further in depth in making those characters change uh, and and do cool things with them. So guys, check this out. Please back this. Uh, Jeff, you are doing the Lord's work in making uh, books like this into these absolute sized editions. Uh, uh, I'm just a fan who got lucky enough. You know, I'm a fan <laughs> who got lucky enough to to be able to work with Mike and convince him that this was a good idea. And uh, we're we're having the time of our life seeing this this whole thing come together. It's amazing. Awesome. I want everybody. I, I, to I, I couldn't have and wouldn't have done this without Jeff. <laughs> Aww. 
<laughs> well, great yeah, stuff. I, like any, I said, just any last words, thing. gents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go <laughs> yeah, go get this book. You'll be glad you did. If you like the Green Arrow stuff that Mike did, this is the precursor to that. This is the series that, without John Sable, I don't think we would have gotten the Green Arrow that we got when uh, when right. Mike took the book. Cool. Absolutely, awesome. you're correct. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Chat, for being here. I appreciate you guys. Let's support some great comics by by this wonderful legend here, who's like uh, a huge inspiration. And I'll see you guys. Uh, on the next stream, as soon as I press my button. Where's my button? <laughs> thanks, button. thanks, John. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to all our backers who've driven this up over $70,000 with 15 days to go. Sorry, 14 days to go. We'll push it. We'll, we want to get this to a hundy. You, you, you definitely you deserve it. a six, a six if, figures if, young lady paycheck here. So <laughs> if, 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 we, if we get to six figures, everybody's going to get something extra special. Sweet.